I'm Paul Carey-Jones. Welcome to Renitidine and Tonic. In the autumn of 1933, Adolf Arthur Harpo Marx crossed the Atlantic by boat and traversed Europe by train on a journey which would culminate in him being the first American to perform in the Soviet Union. Despite some initial culture clashes and typically Marxian or Marxist confusions, Harpo's six-week tour was a triumph. This was in no small part down to the moment where, once the Moscow hierarchy had correctly gauged his cultural importance, Harpo was presented with a full Russian team of producer, director, assistant producer, musical director, two writers, arranger, stage manager, company manager, scenic director, assistant director, plus a full cast of players to learn the roles usually played by the other Marx brothers and adapt them for the conventions of the local audience. Marx's autobiography, which could only ever have been titled Harpo Speaks, is endlessly fascinating, in particular his description of growing up in a New York we can barely believe existed so recently. It's a small world too. Chico Marx's first performing job turns out to be as a replacement for the previous teenage pianist at a Nickelodeon cinema, who had been fired, quote, because customers complained his music hurt their ears, unquote. His name was George Gershwin. Seventy-six years after Harpo's Russian triumph, Scottish opera staff producer Robert Jones is standing in the wings of the Marinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg. Anna Trebko has recently had her first child, and Valerie Gergiev has told her to name the date and role for her return to the stage. She picks Lucia di Lammermoor, and the most suitable production currently available has been shipped over from Glasgow, revival director and all. Whether Robert also travelled in one of the shipping containers is unclear, but I wouldn't have put it past him. Rehearsals are in full swing, although Natrepko has yet to appear, her able deputy filling in for her in the meantime. Robert turns around in the dark to find a young woman sitting in front of him, dressed in what is unmistakably Lucia's costume. But she is neither Natrepko nor her alternate. He introduces himself and politely inquires who she might be. I am decast Lucia. No fewer than four Lucias, with a spare always on hand, ready to go at a moment's notice. To our modern Western eyes, both situations seem like unbelievable extravagances, and surely for us, unnecessary ones. Our opera companies often operate without understudies at all, since we can fly replacements in at a few hours' notice. And similarly, these days surely the full troop of Marx Brothers and support team would fly into Moscow, set up, do their stuff, and fly straight out again. When the current pandemic hit, I was just finishing an article on the challenges of Brexit for British freelance musicians. And before that, I was working on a piece about climate change and the classical music business. The common theme in all three crises is that of an industry addicted to fast, cheap international travel. We're hardly alone in that, of course. Across the globe, airlines are propped up by taxpayers' money, dropping prices far below their real cost to humanity, and therefore millions of individual financial decisions are made on a false premise. The whole, if a crowded aeroplane is safe, why isn't a theatre argument, misses the point that airlines have to be saved and kept running, since we seem incapable of imagining a way of life without air travel on tap whenever and wherever we want it. The recent flights to nowhere trips of up to three hours, which start and end in the same airport, are only the most absurd example of that, like undergoing unnecessary root canal surgery for the fun of it. British orchestras are, like most musical organisations, struggling under the current circumstances. In a way, this might seem odd, since a half-capacity, and therefore socially distanceable, audience is a far from uncommon sight in London's concert halls. But what's missing from that equation are the well-funded foreign dates in the same tour which would absorb the losses of the UK performances. In other words, our orchestras and concert venues are effectively subsidised by other countries. Covid or not, that system was always going to have to adapt to the challenges of Brexit, and Brexit or not, the challenges of climate change. Whichever way you look at it, the classical music industry needs to wean itself off its addiction to unsustainably cheap air travel. What might that look like? Those old Soviet and Russian systems provide at least a hint of evidence that an alternative is possible, although it need not be anywhere near as financially extravagant. I cite those examples only as a nudge to those my age and younger in this part of the world who have no recollection of the time before our current way of doing things with its versatility, variety and attendant precariousness. Aside from his music, one of the main reasons we've spent a whole year venerating Beethoven is surely his significance in establishing the idea of musicians as independent artists, rather than servants and travelling salesmen getting paid only for flogging their latest product. 
As singers, in lapsing back into an entirely freelance way of life, we've allowed ourselves to let a large part of Beethoven's greatest achievement slip through our fingers. Ours is a brutally efficient system, and, as the last few months have surely proved beyond any doubt, the flip side of efficiency is fragility. Consider the starkly differing fortunes of singers based in the USA, with its Darwinistic capitalist approach, and Germany, with its less efficient but far more robust system. There are uncertain times ahead, and further global crises to come. Now is surely the time to consider ways of bolstering the fragility, even if it means sacrificing a degree of efficiency. For this to happen, the opera industry is going to need to overcome its fear of singers. It may seem strange to think of anyone involved in opera as being cantor-phobic, but the industry as a whole is, as a rule, shockingly bad at plucking up the courage to ask singers what they think. And each new step towards greater efficiency has usually also involved a step away from putting singing at the core of what opera is about. Why might that be? Well, the human voice is a sensitive and capricious beast and requires careful handling. And just as only a jockey can really understand a thoroughbred racehorse, only a singer can truly know what a voice needs to perform the extreme tasks that opera demands of it. Singers have a reputation for being difficult. And whatever the truth of that historically, in the vast majority of cases these days, that reputation is completely unfounded. Using the human voice as a professional musical instrument is indeed difficult, and if an operatic production is conceived without any thought as to whether it might help or hinder the singing, you can probably expect the singers to raise objections, just as you might well expect a jockey to raise objections to flogging a racehorse to death through a lack of care and understanding on the part of its owners and trainers. Anyone who views that as being difficult doesn't truly have the best interests of opera at heart. The decreasing presence of singers on the permanent staff of opera companies, in many cases they're now absent altogether, causes an unhealthy imbalance in the knowledge and priorities of those companies. Even those members of staff keen to understand more about singing have nowhere to turn if there are no singers in the building as a matter of daily routine to provide their point of view. That's not to devalue the importance of those in administrative or other artistic roles. Opera is the ultimate team effort and each has their crucial part to play. But surely it shouldn't be controversial to say that singers, too, are a vital cog in the machine. Because in the long run, if opera isn't about singing, it's about nothing. Yes, yes, it's the ultimate collaborative art form, we all get that. But you can see sets and costumes as beautiful, theatres as impressive, performers as dramatically engaging elsewhere. Hell, you can even hear music every bit as good. And if any of those elements is missing in opera, it often fails to satisfy fully. But... If the singing isn't as good as it possibly can be, and needs to be, then none of the other parts can possibly make up the shortfall of the whole. And if opera has to have singing at its very core to succeed, that too is where the singers must be. Let's be realistic here. I know we're not heading back to an era of expensive and cumbersome full teams of company principals any day soon, in this country at least. Although, having said that, since the first couple of weeks rehearsing with any ad hoc cast is largely spent getting to know each other, a regular core of artists who are familiar with their way of working saves wise companies time, and therefore money. And one way or another, major opera companies whose funding and administration operates on a year-round basis risk their very existence if they don't strive to provide year-round opera. Any step away from a non-disposable approach to singers is one down a slippery slope where companies open themselves up to the temptation of producing anything other than opera, which, let's face it, is almost always the easier and more profitable option. As the combined effect of current and coming crises causes the world to get larger again, opera companies need to re-engage with the communities from which they first sprung. Audiences and critics may need weaning off the assumption that the lure of the foreign and exotic is automatically superior to the homegrown product, but that can be a positive thing if the opportunity is seized and needn't mean entirely excluding guest artists from abroad either. I always find it easier to adapt my work to a new part of the world when I'm alongside colleagues familiar with how things work there. Even the genius of Harpo needed local help to make the Soviet Union laugh. The opera industry needs to find better ways of listening to its singers and of embracing them into its decision-making processes, from the most mundane to the highest long-term strategic level. Not that opera companies should be run for the benefit of their singers, but maximising the quality of their singing should be at the core of every move a company makes. It won't necessarily make anyone's life easier, but it'll make the singing better. 
and dare I say it, that's what opera is about. If you enjoy this sort of thing, you can read more of it in my new book, Giving It Away, Classical Music in Lockdown and Other Fairy Tales. Available in paperback and Kindle editions via Amazon websites worldwide. And watch out for the new audiobook edition coming soon on Audible. For more details and the latest news on all of this, visit my website at www.paulcarryjones.net. And please don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel.